Warren Hastings, 1772-1785 Learning Objectives Student will acquire knowledge about 1. The growth of East India Company's rule in India 2. Reforms introduced by the first Governor General, Warren Hastings 3. Proficiency, Merits and Defects of the Regulating Act of 1773 4. Expansion Policy of Warren Hastings, the First Maratha War and the Second Mysore War 5. Pitt's India Act of 1784 6. Impeachment of Warren Hastings The English East India Company the English East India Company was established on 31st December 1600 as per the Royal Charter issued by the Queen of England, Elizabeth I. The company had sent Captain Hawkins to the court of the Mughal Emperor Jahangir in 1608 to secure permission to establish a factory, storehouse of goods at Surat. It was turned down initially. However, in 1613, Jahangir issued the firman permitting the East India Company to establish its first trading post at Surat. Subsequently, Sir Thomas Rowe obtained more trading rights and privileges for the East India Company. Accordingly, the English set up business centers at Agra, Ahmedabad and Broch. Slowly, the English East India Company succeeded in expanding its area of trade. In 1639, Francis Day established the city of Madras and constructed the Fort St. George. On the west coast, the company obtained Bombay on lease from their king Charles II for a rent of £10 per annum in 1668. By the year 1690, Job Charnock, the agent of the East India Company, purchased three villages namely Sutanuti, Govindpur and Calicutta which in course of time grew into the city of Calcutta. It was fortified by Job Charnock, who named it Fort William after the English king, William III. The factories and trading centers which the English established all along the sea coast of India were grouped under three presidencies namely Bombay, Madras and Calcutta. After the Battle of Plassey In 1757 and the Battle of Buxar in 1764, the company became a political power. India was under the East India Company's rule till 1858, when it came under the direct administration of the British Crown. Robert Clive was the first governor of Fort William under the company's rule. He was succeeded by Verulst and Cartier. In 1772, the company appointed Warren Hastings as the governor of Fort William. Reforms of Warren Hastings When Warren Hastings assumed the administration of Bengal in 1772, he found it in utter chaos. The financial position of the company became worse and the difficulties were intensified by famine. Therefore, Warren Hastings realized the immediate need for introducing reforms. Abolition of the Dual System the East India Company decided to act as Devon and to undertake the collection of revenue by its own agents. Hence, the dual system introduced by Robert Clive was abolished. As a measure to improve the finances of the company, Warren Hastings reduced the Nawab's allowance of 32 lakhs of rupees to half that amount. He also stopped the annual payment of 26 lakhs given to the Mughal Emperor. Revenue Reforms after the abolition of the dual system, the responsibility of collecting the revenue fell on the shoulders of the company. For that purpose, a board of revenue was established at Calcutta to supervise the collection of revenue. English collectors were appointed in each district. The treasury was removed from Murshidabad to Calcutta, and an accountant general was appointed. 
Calcutta thus became the capital of Bengal in 1772 and shortly after of British India. The Board of Revenue farmed out the lands by by auction for a period of five years instead of one year in order to find out their real value. The zamindars were given priority in the auction. However, certain good measures were taken to safeguard the interests of the peasants. Arbitrary cesses and unreasonable fines were abolished. Besides, restrictions were imposed on the enhancement of rent. Yet, the system was a failure. Many zamindars defaulted and the arrears of revenue accumulated. Reorganization of the Judicial System The judicial system at the time of Warren Hastings' ascendancy was a storehouse of abuses. The Nawab who was hitherto the chief administrator of justice misused his powers. Often, his judgments were careless. The zamindars who acted as judges at lower levels within their own areas were highly corrupt and prejudiced. On the whole, the judicial institution suffered from extreme corruption. Warren Hastings felt the necessity of reorganizing the judicial system. Each district was provided with a civil court under the collector and a criminal court under an Indian judge. To hear appeals from the district courts two appellate courts, one for civil cases and another for criminal cases, were established at Calcutta. The highest civil court of appeal was called Sutter Diwani Adalat, which was to be presided over by the governor and two judges recruited from among the members of his council. Similarly, the highest appellate criminal court was known as Sutter Nizamat Adalat, which was to function under an Indian judge appointed by the governor in council. Experts in Hindu and Muslim laws were provided to assist the judges. A digest of Hindu law was prepared in Sanskrit by learned pundits, and it was translated into Persian. An English translation of it Code of Hindu Laws was prepared by Haught. Trade Regulations and Other Reforms Warren Hastings abolished the system of dastics, or free passes, and regulated the internal trade. He reduced the number of custom houses and enforced a uniform tariff of 2.5% for Indian and non-Indian goods. Private trade by the company's servants continued, but within enforceable limits. Weavers were given better treatment and facilities were made to improve their condition. He also introduced a uniform system of prepaid postage system. A bank was started in Calcutta. He improved the police in Calcutta, and the dacoits were severely dealt with. The Regulating Act of 1773 The Regulating Act of 1773 opened a new chapter in the constitutional history of the company. Previously, the home government in England consisted of the Court of Directors and the Court of Proprietors. The Court of Directors were elected annually and practically managed the affairs of the company. In India, each of the three presidencies was independent and responsible only to the home government. The government of the presidency was conducted by a governor and a council. The following conditions invited the parliamentary intervention in the company's affairs. The English East India Company became a territorial power when it acquired a wide dominion in India and also the Diwani rights. Its early administration was not only corrupt but notorious. When the company was in financial trouble, its servants were affluent. The disastrous famine which broke out in Bengal in 1770 affected the agriculturists. As a result, the revenue collection was poor. In short, the company was on the brink of bankruptcy. In 1773, the company approached the British government for an immediate loan. It was under these circumstances that the Parliament of England resolved to regulate the affairs of the company. Lord North, the Prime Minister of England, appointed a select committee to inquire into the affairs of the company. The report submitted by the committee paved the way for the enactment of the Regulating Act. Provisions of the Act The Regulating Act reformed the company's government at home and in India. The important provisions of the Act were I. The term of office of the members of the Court of Directors was extended from one year to four years. One fourth of them were to retire every year, and the retiring directors were not eligible for re election. 2. The Governor of Bengal was styled the Governor General of Fort William, whose tenure of office was for a period of five years. 3. A council of four members was appointed to assist the Governor General. 
the government was to be conducted in accordance with the decision of the majority. The governor-general had a casting vote in case of a tie. 4. The governor-general in council was made supreme over the other presidencies in matters of war and peace. V. Provision was made in the Act for the Establishment of a Supreme Court at Calcutta consisting of a Chief Justice and three junior judges. It was to be independent of the Governor, General in Council. In 1774, the Supreme Court was established by a royal charter. 6. This Act prevented the servants of the company including the Governor General, members of his Council, and the judges of the Supreme Court from receiving directly or indirectly any gifts in kind or cash. Merits and Demerits of the Act The significance of the Regulating Act is that it brought the affairs of the company under the control of the Parliament. Besides, it proved that the Parliament of England was concerned about the welfare of Indians. The greatest merit of this Act is that it put an end to the arbitrary rule of the company and provided a framework for all future enactments relating to the governing of India. The main defect of the Act was that the Governor-General was made powerless because the Council which was given supreme power often created deadlocks by overruling his decision. However, many of these defects were rectified by the Pitt's India Act of 1784. Expansionist Policy of Warren Hastings Warren Hastings was known for his expansionist policy. His administration witnessed the Rohila War, the First Anglo-Maratha War, and the Second Anglo-Mysore War. The Rohila War, 1774 Rohilkand was a small kingdom situated in between Oud and the Marathas. Its ruler was Hafiz Rahmath Khan. He concluded a defensive treaty in 1772 with the Nawab of Oud fearing an attack by the Marathas. But no such attack took place. But, the Nawab demanded money. When Rehmuth Khan evaded, the Nawab with the help of the British invaded Rohilkand. Warren Hastings, who sent the British troops against Rohilkand was severely criticized for his policy on Rohila affair. First Anglo-Maratha War, 1775-82 The Marathas were largely remained disunited since the Third Battle of Panipat, 1761. The internal conflict among the Marathas was best utilized by the British in their expansionist policy. In 1775, there was a dispute for the post of Peshwa between Madhav Rao and his uncle Raghunatha Rao. The British authorities in Bombay concluded the Treaty of Surat with Raghunatha Rao in March 1775. Raghunatha Rao promised to cede Basin and Salzet to the British but later, when he was unwilling to fulfill his promise, the British captured them. This action of the Bombay government was not approved by Warren Hastings. In 1776, Warren Hastings sent Colonel Upton to settle the issue. He cancelled the Treaty of Surat and concluded the Treaty of Parandar with Nana Fadnavis, another Maratha leader. According to this treaty mother of Rao II was accepted as the new Peshwa, and the British retained Salzet along with a heavy war indemnity. However, the home authorities rejected the Treaty of Parandar. Warren Hastings also considered the Treaty of Purandar as a scrap of paper and sanctioned operations against the Marathas. In the meantime, the British force sent by the Bombay government was defeated by the Marathas. In 1781, Warren Hastings dispatched British troops under the command of Captain Popham. He defeated the Maratha chief, Mahataji Sindhya, in a number of small battles and captured Gwalior. Later in May 1782, the Treaty of Salbei was signed between Warren Hastings and Mahataji Sindhya. Accordingly, Salzet and Basin were given to the British. Raghunath Rao was pensioned off and Madhav Rao too was accepted as the Peshwa. The Treaty of Salbei established the British influence in Indian politics. It provided the British 20 years of peace with the Marathas. The treaty also enabled the British to exert pressure on Mysore, with the help of the Marathas in recovering their territories from Hader Ali. Thus, the British on the one hand, saved themselves from the combined opposition of Indian powers and on the other, succeeded in dividing the Indian powers. The Second Anglo-Mysore War, 1780-84 The First Anglo-Mysore War took place in 1767-69. 
Hader Ali emerged victorious against the British, and at the end of the war a defensive treaty was concluded between Hader Ali and the British. After eleven years, the Second Mysore War broke out, and the main causes for the Second Anglo-Mysore War were 1. The British failed to fulfill the terms of the defensive treaty with Hader when he was attacked by the Marathas in 1771. 2. There was an outbreak of hostilities between the English and the French, an ally of Hader, during the American War of Independence. 3. The British captured Maha, a French settlement within Hader's territories. 4. Hader Ali formed a grand alliance with the Nizam of Hyderabad and the Marathas against the British in 1779. The war began when the British led their forces through Hader's territory without his permission to capture Guntur in the northern Sarkars. Hader Ali defeated Colonel Bailey and captured Arcot in 1780. In the next year, Warren Hastings, by a clever stroke of diplomacy, divided the Confederacy. He made peace with the Nizam, won the friendship of Bosle, and came to an understanding with the Sindhya, both Marathas. Consequently, Hader was isolated without any alliance. He was defeated by Sir Ercoot at Porto Novo in March 1781. In December 1782, Hader died of cancer at the age of 60, and his death was kept secret till his son Tipu Sultan assumed power. The Second Mysore War came to an end by the Treaty of Mangalore in 1783. Accordingly, all conquests were mutually restored and the prisoners on both sides were liberated. Pitt's India Act, 1784 The regulating act proved to be an unsatisfactory document as it failed in its objective. In January 1784, Pitt the Younger, who became Prime Minister of England after the general elections, introduced the India Bill in the British Parliament. Despite bitter debate in both the houses, the bill was passed after seven months, and it received royal assent in August 1784. This was the famous Pitt's India Act of 1784. Main Provisions I, a board of control consisting of six members, was created. They were appointed by the Crown. 2. The Court of Directors was retained without any alteration in its composition. 3. The Act also introduced significant changes in the Indian administration. It reduced the number of the members of the Governor-General's Council from four to three, including the Commander-in-Chief. Pitt's India Act constitutes a significant landmark with regard to the foreign policy of the company. A critical review of the Act reveals that it had introduced a kind of contradiction in the functions of the company. The Court of Directors controlled its commercial functions, whereas the Board of Control maintained its political affairs. In fact, the Board represented the King, and the directors symbolized the company. The Impeachment of Warren Hastings The Pitts India Act of 1784 was a rude shock and bitter disappointment for Warren Hastings. The Prime Minister's speech censuring the policy of the government of Bengal was considered by Warren Hastings as a reflection on his personal character. His image and reputation were tarnished in England. Therefore, he resigned and left India in June 1785. In 1787, Warren Hastings was impeached in the Parliament by Edmund Burke and the Whigs for his administrative excess. Burke brought forward 22 charges against him. The most important of them were related to the Rohila War, the case of Nanda Kumar, the treatment of Raja Chait Singh of Banaras and the pressures on the Begums of Oud. After a long trail which lasted till 1795, Warren Hastings was completely acquitted. He received pension from the company and lived till 1818. Nanda Kumar was an influential official in Bengal. He was hanged to death by the verdict of the Supreme Court at Calcutta for a petty offense of forgery. The English law was applied in this judgment. It was contended that Warren Hastings and Sir Elijah MP, the judge of the Supreme Court conspired against Nanda Kumar. Warren Hastings imposed heavy penalty on the Raja Chait Singh of Banaras for his delay in payment of tribute and deposed him in an unjust manner. The Begums of Oud were mother and grandmother of the Nawab of Oud. 
Warren Hastings helped the Nawab by sending his troops to the help of Nawab who squeezed money from the Begums. This was a high-handed policy. Estimate of Warren Hastings He was a gifted personality endowed with strong will, great energy and resourcefulness. His long stay in Bengal in the shadow of the Mughal cultural tradition gave him enough opportunity to learn Oriental languages such as Bengali, the local language, and Persian, the diplomatic language, and to develop Oriental tastes. Since he considered Indian culture as a basis for sound Indian administration, he patronized the learning of Indian languages and arts. His task was a challenging one since he was surrounded by hostile forces. He faced his external enemies with unflinching courage and unfailing resource, and his internal opponents with extraordinary patience and firmness. It was on the foundation which Warren Hastings laid down that others erected a stately edifice. Learning outcome after learning this lesson the students will be to explain 1. How the East India Company established its rule in India. 2. The reforms of Warren Hastings such as revenue, judicial and trade. 3. The purpose of the Regulating Act, its merits and defects. 4. Expansion policy of Warren Hastings and the outcome of the First Anglo-Maratha War and Second Anglo-Mysore War. 5. The importance of the Pitts India Act of 1784. 6. The general achievements of Warren Hastings.